good evening and welcome to the final installment of our ARIA 20 roundtable series in celebration of the Asia Research Institute's 20th anniversary. My name is Maitri Young Nguyen, Deputy Director of the Asia Research Institute and Chair of tonight's event, ARI and Asian Futures in Humanities and Social Sciences Research. It's great to see that so many of you connected to ARI in a variety of ways have tuned in from around the world. Former colleagues and alumni, international board members, research collaborators and partners, as well as current RE members, cluster associates and management board members, welcome. Tonight's event caps a series of anniversary roundtables that have focused on charting RE's current and future trajectories. First, we'll be hearing from our cluster leaders about our research directions. Then we will invite them to share their thoughts on the important issues facing the region and the world in a roundtable discussion moderated by Professor Tantayong. However, before we get into the heart of tonight's session, let's hear some perspectives on Ari and its role in scholarship in this short video. Established in 2001 at the National University of Singapore, the Asia Research Institute, popularly known as Ari, brings together scholars working across the social sciences and humanities. ARI forms a vital space for Asia-focused, cross-disciplinary research collaboration. We want to build an exciting place for everybody to come, where you can see whether your theories make sense from an Asian perspective, but not ruling somebody out because they don't know enough about Asia. Singapore's position is extraordinary. That's what makes it important and so exciting. Over 20 years, ARI has matured into one of the world's foremost research centers on Asia. For two decades, ARI each year has recruited some of the brightest and, and best talents in humanities and social science, working on Asian topics. And uh, many of the most pressing problems of our times are ones that require humanities and social science knowledge, but also require that we as humanities and social science scholars collaborate with people from other disciplines too. Climate change, food security, these are all issues that you need collaborative relations and, and research with, with people with other kinds of skills and backgrounds too. RE also serves as a key centre that provides opportunities to scholars from Singapore and around the world to visit and interact with leading experts in the field. RE is a very open, global, and a diverse institute, diverse in terms of its research topics, displays, and also backgrounds of the researchers. But what really made ARI special is its organicity, the sense of being deeply grounded in the region, therefore in the world, in something real, it is special. What the contribution of ARI in the present and in the future of Asian studies is to really demonstrate that Asia can be an intellectual springboard to theorize more broadly about relevant global issues. I think ARI is definitely a prime center of that sort of innovative research because of its global perspective and its commitment to taking Asia seriously as a coherent whole so we can see in the selection of fellows in the workshops and seminars and conferences that ARI organises. ARI does not have an insular view about you know, how Asia can benefit Singapore. It's about how Singapore can work with the rest of Asia. When we were starting to look more internationally and to develop you know, an international profile, and, and ARI as, um, was very much starting to position itself um, with, a, with a really a grand strategy almost to really build um, a reputation to be the place to do uh, research on Asia in Asia. It's been I think very much not just mirroring the way Asian studies has developed but actually defining it I think uh, in many ways. We now look at trans-regional types of connections. We look at the interactions between communities. We look at the flows, you know, ideas and goods and people and so forth. And Ari's very much been at the heart of that. Ari's place in the intellectual landscape uh, of Asian studies is so well established now that it's really a time for Ari to be playing a leadership role in, in various ways. Asia is 
way too important to be only of interest to Asianists. However you look at the world, whether it be in terms of demography, whether it be in terms of GDP, whether it be in terms of ecological impact, Asia is of global planetary significance. Terrific. Let's now hear from our research cluster leaders. For this session, each cluster leader will have four to five minutes to present. Um, so we will first start with Professor Tim Bunnell, director of ARI and leader of our Asian urbanism cluster. Hello, everyone. Um, so the research cluster I lead concerns urbanization, urban spaces, and urban lives. The awkward sounding urbanisms is a deliberate pluralization intended to foreground and to take seriously a diversity of urban forms, trajectories, and human experiences across Asia. And of course, involving lots of linkages elsewhere too. Asia's importance to the so-called urban age is often underscored in aggregate terms. By most conventional measures, Asia marks the center of gravity of our urbanizing planet. Not only does that, that give rise to lots of important regional challenges and issues in its own right, from planning to the politics of inclusion, from housing to heritage, and from economic livelihoods to sustainability, it also means that urban scholarship in and from Asia should be at the forefront of theorizing our urban world today, profoundly unsettling the historical geography of academic urban theory production in which experiences from Europe and North America have tended to predominate. The plural Asian urbanisms then treats Asia's diversity as a scholarly resource rather than positing some singular Asian experience of urbanization in opposition to Western inherited, um, inherited Western centered uh, understandings. I resumed cluster leadership uh, in July this year. It's fair, fair to say that we're in a, a rebuilding phase, not through any fault of my predecessor, Ho Kong Chong, he, he did an excellent job, uh, but simply because several cluster members recruited by Kong Chong have left in recent months and there've been delays in onboarding new recruits. The cluster also has a large group of associates. They include two broad categories of urbanists. First, those based elsewhere on NUS campus who are not appointed into the cluster, but who are within its intellectual orbit. And second, former cluster members who continue association by dint of being involved in ongoing collaborations of various kinds. Overall, the three main strands of research around which the Asian Urbanisms Cluster is currently being refashioned are First, urban heritage and the vernacular city. Second, city futures. And third, global urban frontiers. The first of those really flourished under my predecessors, looking at the city of everyday life, its local practices and productions as heritage. Now wearing my ARI director's hat, I actually like the idea of heritage becoming the focus of a research cluster in its own right. But for the time being, specifically urban heritage is flagged here within the Asian urbanisms cluster. The second strand is city futures. Both authority defined and everyday imaginings of urban futures have been among my research interests for quite some time. And I would say that this topic has assumed even greater significance lately. Responses to COVID-19 intersect in consequential ways with established city, pl city planning models, more recent smart and digital city initiatives, and also with climate crisis related goals, targets and anxieties. And then thirdly, the global urban frontiers strand relates to burgeoning international work on planetary urbanization, thinking about urbanization in Asia beyond the city as a process that extends into ostensibly extra urban hinterlands and landscapes, and that isn't even limited to land, to terra firma. There's a burgeoning literature, for example, on oceanic urbanization. And so relatedly, I see part of this third strand as including consideration of urbanization in three-dimensional or volumetric terms, whether that be to do with undersea resources or subterranean infrastructure or high-rise living. So yes, these are my three research strands, um, the substantive priorities for the cluster moving forward. In line with ARI's KPIs, it's very important to turn some of these aspects into, um, into specific fundable 
research projects. Ongoing hiring decisions are being made partly with that in mind. And some existing cluster members and associates, see from the slide here, are already involved in related research projects that are at various stages of development. Okay, so that's from me. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our next speaker will be Professor Kenneth Dean, leader of our religion and globalization cluster. This is the uh, list of our cluster members. Uh, please take a quick look. Uh, just go over some of the the ongoing challenges and dynamics of religion and globalization in Asia that we're interested in. Of course, uh, as you can all uh, understand, radical fundamentalism in many religious traditions can and does generate between religious communities. And sadly, many such challenges uh, continue to exist in South East and Southeast Asia, and Ari will be watching these. Uh, now, another theme is the collapse of the secularization thesis that argued that under modernization, religion would simply wither away. Whereas the Asian case shows in contrast, the remarkable resilience and creativity of plural religious traditions. And now we see many religious groups trying to renegotiate their roles and possibilities in post-secular societies. Another dynamic we're, we're following is the continuing struggle between secular states or secularizing states and religious communities. Uh, we see the sacro sacralization of the secular state in the cult of Xi Jinping. And, and we also see on the other hand, the rise of religious nationalism in India under Modi. Both lead to very adverse effects on the Muslim minority populations of those countries. And uh, we believe that Ari has a role in documenting the survival and transformations of the great diversity of religious traditions in this area. So what research methods have we developed to document and to explain these dynamics? On the one hand, we're working on GIS mapping of changing distributions of religious communities and ritual traditions across Asia. We're also developing collaborative digital research uh, platforms, digital platforms, such as the Singapore Historical GIS, I'll introduce in a moment, Singapore Biographical Databases. These are designed for researchers as well as the public to contribute data and to share information. We're also developing pretty sophisticated online ethnographic methods to deal with the COVID situation. Uh, how will global phenomenon uh, uh, shape Asia and religion in, in Asia? Here, I'll just restrict my comments to the impact of the coronavirus on religious life and institutions. This has obviously been very profound. Many ritual performances have been restricted or canceled and many religious organizations have had to develop online rituals, hygienic ritual pr procedures and move towards highly mediated forms of ritual and community, leaving many individuals with a sense of deep loss and isolation. And we need to follow these trends closely and carefully over the coming years as the pandemic sadly may have many more years to play its uh, role in and impact communities across Asia. Finally, how can we think from Asia and contribute to the humanities and the social sciences? I believe we have a great opportunity to reassess the very definition of religion, which has been uncritically adapt adapted from Western historical experience and imposed on Asian populations. We can challenge the priority given by post-Reformation theories of religion to the importance of doctrine and belief and sincerity and ritual performance and come up with an alternative theory, analyzing and prioritizing ritual experience within multiple complex ritual traditions. We need to theorize the long history and future possibilities for religious plurality in Asia. And we need to theorize the density and flexibility and speed of circulation within the religious network stretching across Asia. And this is what we're hoping to do. What, this is what we're doing currently in our many workshops and seminars and publications. This is our Koranasur uh, research blog, it has over 100 posts from both academics, uh, religious specialists, and members of religious communities across Asia. I welcome you to look into it, check it out, see if you find something interesting there. Maybe you would like to contribute something to the blog. It's an effort to move beyond academic only access to include many more people in uh, documenting their experience of, of the pandemic and its effects on religious communities. This is uh, our uh, historical GIS, which 
shows a, a very, very dense and rich uh, religious uh, ecology within Singapore, as you can see from, from this very, very densely packed slide. Uh, we're trying to extend this now to uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, hopefully later to Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia. So these are some of the uh, conferences that we've held uh, over the past year, a few years. Uh, you can see from the titles the kinds of uh, issues that we're trying to deal with. And uh, we feel this is a very good way of, of bringing the, the themes that I just mentioned to the fore uh, through very uh, detailed, uh, you know, very focused uh, conferences and workshops. These are some of our publications over the past few years. Uh, we're very uh, proud of the work of our cluster members who've uh, been publishing a lot of really interesting work. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a number of those, those books. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the historical documentation that we're still publishing because there's a great deal of this history that's as yet undocumented and deserves further study. Thank you for this opportunity to present some of the uh, issues of uh, concern to our research cluster. Thank you, Prof. Dean. Uh, next, we have Prof. Jin Young and the leader of our uh, Changing Family in Asia cluster. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a great pleasure to be here to share with you what uh, the Changing Family in Asia cluster has done in ARI. Um, all right, so uh, Changing Family in Asia cluster, or short for uh, family cluster, is one of the oldest cluster in ARI, uh, started in 2003. And the cluster will be closed officially at the end of this year. So at this point, we are at a closing uh, ending phase. So this is more of a re reflecting of what, of what we have done. In the past 18 years, uh, we have had two cluster leaders. Professor Gavin Jones uh, uh, started, it was the funding cluster leader in 2003. In 2010, I took over that role and until now. The cluster has three clear strategic aims. One is to be a global thought leader on how and why Asian families have been changing. And a lot of those changes are pretty dramatic and the consequences of those changes. Secondly, we train and mentor the next generation of scholars on family research. And thirdly, to inform the public policies and general public uh, based on our research findings and uh, you know, through various academic journals, conferences, and also the media of uh, very different forms. Uh, looking back, I think we have uh, accomplished all three aims quite successfully. We do have uh, a lot of family members uh, cluster members uh, in the past. In fact, we just made a, a video uh, documenting our alumni and uh, 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 achievement uh, that the video would be available on YouTube uh, soon if you're interested in looking at it. Our approach over the years, at least in the last uh, dozens of years, has been to hold international conferences, uh, two international conferences every year and to make sure that we produce at least one and sometimes two special issues out of every conferences that we have, every conference we had uh, held. So these are some of the examples of what kind of topics that we have uh, been focusing on in the last few years. Uh, you can see that we've been focusing more on aging issues in recent years focusing on exploring a productive aging concept in Asia, which has uh, not been done before, looking at the long-term care for elderly in ASEAN plus three countries, and uh, uh, looking at the issues related to retirement and leisure of the elderly. We've also been uh, interested in um, how econom economy has been affecting uh, the family, for example, after the financial crisis, uh, we have looked at how the uncertain labor markets have affected the young children's transition to adulthood, like their labor market jobs, their marriage, fertility, and so on. 
Uh, we've also looked in at different changing family forms, like new forms such as the uh, step families, uh, the increasing trend of living alone, and so on. We've looked at uh, migration and marriage trends, and we've looked at uh, children, you know, parents' uh, changing value of children, migrant children, and children left behind, how they are doing, and so on. Uh, over the years, of course, there's a lot of uh, publications, including uh, examples here again, uh, books that document uh, family and population changes in Singapore, economic stress and how that affect human capital and families in Asia, transnational divorces and uh, uh, journal articles. A lot of them, we, as I say, in the last uh, six years, we have published uh, 15 uh, special issues in different uh, journals. Many of them are leading journals in the field, such as Journal of Marriage and Family, Family Issues, Social uh, and Med, uh, social science medicine, GEMS, demographic research, and so on. Uh, on different topics here, you can see. And uh, again, Journal of Gerontology, Aging and Health. These are all quite uh, visible and leading journals in the field. And we have done a lot of work on youth and transition to adulthood as well. Uh, so uh, over the years, uh, our alumni have spread all over the almost all different continents, certainly uh, United States, Europe, Australia, and uh, many countries in Asia, uh, definitely in uh, Singapore as well. They're in key positions in NTU uh, and US and uh, SUSS and so on. So we're very proud of their uh, accomplishment and what uh, our cluster has done in uh, ARI in the last uh, 18 years. So thank you very much for, for the, your attention. Thank you very much, for, uh, Professor Young, um, who will be followed by Associate Professor Gregory Clancy, leader of our Science, Technology, and Society cluster. Thank you, Maitri. Science, Technology, and Society, or STS, is a very widespread interdisciplinary project with over 170 research and teaching centers around the world. Our cluster is the principal STS research unit in Singapore and arguably in Asia although we have many partners in this region and in other Singapore universities. As the phrase suggests, we study the social and cultural dimensions of science and technology, but around themes tailored to our region of the world. Uh, medicines have been central to us because science in Singapore is largely revolved around health, and we've not neglected Asian indigenous medicines, which are major industries in their own right. Technologies are also natural focus, given that Asia is on the cutting edge of adopting new ones to social purposes. The environment is an increasing specialty of ours, as it is in the other RE clusters, and we work across clusters in all these areas. And an even more recent interest is in what I'll call non-humans, which can refer both to the red panda hiding in the forest in this slide, as well as the robot dog out for a walk. Many of our projects combine two or more of these themes, sometimes all four. A good example is our longest standing initiative, a recurring consultancy with the International Atomic Energy Agency around Japanese recovery, effort, recovery efforts from the Fukushima disaster. We've attended or co-organized 18 conferences on this theme in the last decade, one that just ended yesterday, and two of which were held here in Singapore. This project involves public health communication, technological failures and successes, environmental degradation and restoration, and even non-humans such as the irradiated boar in the lower left-hand corner who are rewilding the area evacuated by human beings. This is also one project where we've made a significant ongoing contribution to global policy. We've always been grant active as have the other clusters. Our current flagship grant funded project is Heat in Urban Asia, Past, Present and Future. The poster on the left is from our most recent international conference, and the images on the right are from our soon to be launched interactive website. A lot of scholars around the world are studying the urban heat island effect, as we are, but we're the only research group looking at it from an Asian regional perspective, and also historicizing. After all, parts of Asia have been living with extreme heat for centuries, and not necessarily in the form of waves, but chronically. This is also our first foray into digital humanities, 
Our website is pitched toward informing a general educated public and not just specialists. As for future projects, the STS cluster is a partner in a pending tier three grant application organized by NTU's Earth Observatory called INVEST. Singapore is already a center of expertise on earthquakes, volcanoes, and geologic matters generally. But this project, if funded, will take that research to a whole new level. Our role will be investigating the historical and long-term cultural effects of seismicity and volcanism in the so-called ring of fire, which helps define Southeast Asia. But we'll also be working with the scientists to in better mapping geological hazards using historical evidence. Like the Fukushima initiative, and to a lesser extent, the heat one, the INVEST project shows our commitment to productive teamwork with those in scientific disciplines, and also demonstrates their belief that the addition of humanities and social science scholars to their projects give them additional depth and extend their influence. Likewise, we have a track record of enrolling scientists into our own humanities projects. This is another pending grant initiative in which we're collaborating with zoologists and biologists around the common concern of species extinction. Loopholes often exist in wildlife trade regulations for animals used in traditional medicines. But who's to determine which animals and which uses were traditional, if not historians and anthropologists? By creating a database with sources from pharmacopoeia to trade statistics, we mean to paint a comprehensive historical picture of medicinal animal usage in Asia. And in so doing, we hope to say something important about the sustainable and ethical use of animal medicines in a period of zoonotic disease and mass extinction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Our next speaker will be Professor Naoko Shimazu, leader of our Inter-Asia Engagements Cluster. Okay, thanks, Maitri. Um, so my name is Naoko Shimazu, and I'm a global historian of Asia. And I became the uh, research cluster leader of um, the Inter-Asia Engagements Cluster. We call it IAE for short, uh, since July of this year. So I'm very new to this job. Um, and so in some sense, I'm kind of um, going to use this opportunity to outline a bit of my vision for this cluster. And I also am appointed at Yale NAS College uh, as, a, as a professor of history there. Okay, so this is our cluster. It's quite a big cluster with um, quite a lot of uh, active um, members. And I just want to very quickly kind of highlight some of um, the cluster members. Um, Stefan Hugner uh, has been uh, at RE since 2016. And he's trained as a historian of modern Japan, but currently, is working on very kind of wacky, interesting projects on um, the world's oceans, um, uh, which I'll tell you a bit about uh, later. And then Michelle Miller is also a very, uh, very much an old hand at Ari. And uh, she is a senior research fellow and she works on the political geographies of environmental governance and urban change um, and has worked extensively on Indonesia and on the uh, Mekong region in particular. And then with the postdocs, we have um, Gerard McCarthy, who is a political scientist and interested in working on the uh, politics of inequality, uh, mostly in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. And then we have Yang Yang, who is a human geographer and works on the Hui Muslims in China and their connections with non-Chinese Muslims in Southeast Asia, as well as uh, in the, with the Middle East. And then last but not least, Jorge Bayona, who just joined as um, a postdoctoral um, associate uh, in, uh, in October. And he's a trans-Pacific historian connecting Peru with the Philippines in the 1920s and 30s through uh, the networks and activities of revolutionaries. And he is currently still trans-Pacifically located in Lima and will hopefully join us soon in Singapore. Now we have uh, two visiting uh, uh, research fellows. One is a senior fellow, uh, Sun Shifan, who is a professor of international relations from Tsinghua. University, and he is working on the um, China's foreign policy in Asia, in East Asia in particular. And then Dr. Chun Hui Ko, who is an Ottoman specialist um, currently visiting us from the uh, University of California, uh, Los Angeles. 
we've all been kind of asked to think about what our cluster means. And so what do we mean by Inter-Asia? So the current name uh, dates back to 2016 to Professor Johnson Rigg, who was then the director of ARI. And so the cluster, um, the way I see it anyway, as a new cluster leader, is that it seeks to uh, problematize the way we think about Asia and the potential of anchoring Asia at the center of many global developments uh, in the line of this global Asia framework. Now, what is perhaps notable uh, is that it attempts to emphasize Asia's connections transregionally uh, rather than the more traditional approach of looking at Asia or its parts as regionally exclusive units of study. So to this end, Professor N. Seng Ho, who has been the member as the distinguished Mohamed Alago chair in our cluster, this, um, his program called the Mohamed Alago Arabia Asia program has been an important catalyst in embracing the Indian Ocean more wholeheartedly in our cluster uh, as, as, an, uh, as a way of accessing the Middle East uh, from this part of Asia in Southeast Asia. So one of the questions we ask is whether Asian experiences can offer basis for theorizations at a more general level. And this has been mentioned um, by director Tim Bano in particular in his, um, in his uh, uh, speech. Um, but uh, what, what we are going to do as a cluster is that we are planning a kind of brainstorming session, an intra-cluster brainstorming session in order to revisit this uh, definition of concern and how we as cluster members practice it in our research. So there's this theory and practice and that connection we find to be, uh, we, we, we think it to be a very important thing to think about as we do our research. Now, um, if you look at this, uh, there's that thing called the sandpit of ideas. So my priority is really to foster exper experimental thinking in interdisciplinary research. And the IA cluster is unusual in that it does not have a thematic boundary. And instead, it is about not having boundaries of any kind and enabling colleagues to think beyond their boxes, beyond their knowledge and methodology to explore new ideas in research. And I know this is ambitious with quite a bit of blue sky thinking involved, but I strongly believe that we need to have an experimental space to try out new ideas and to try out new collaborations with scholars from different disciplines. And of course, this doesn't always lead to success, but failures are very important in, um, in learning about how to think about the next phase and next uh, new ideas um, uh, coming up in the horizon as a result of our experiences. Um, so just as an indication, so we have the current themes and we actually have quite a lot of things going on and it's been quite a uh, problem trying to think of definitive themes, but we do have at least four. And one is the environmental issues. Uh, and you will see why this is a prominent theme in our cluster. And also another thing is the infrastructures of connection and integration, which we are hoping to expand and strengthen in the coming years. Um, and the third one is COVID-19 and its implications. And uh, I think we as clusters, as well as all the other clusters, I'm sure, uh, feel the importance of being able to respond to um, current crisis in, um, in Asia, as well as in the world. And so we have uh, started a small project, pilot project, but uh, we think that this is going to lead to further projects um, in the years to come. And then the fourth one is uh, new approaches to diplomacy and uh, cultural heritage, which is connected to that. Now, um, as an indication of uh, this kind of variedness of um, our research themes and methodologies, uh, we organized two round, table, um, round tables from our cluster for this uh, RE 2020 anniversary series. And Professor Isaac Curlo, uh, who is a renowned documentary filmmaker, he organized a panel around his documentary feature film called The Tsunami of New Dreams uh, and had a uh, kind of discussion basically reflecting on the uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami 
focusing on the Bandache experience. And this actually ties in very nicely with the um, founding director of ARI, uh, Professor Tony Rhee's interests in Bandache as well. And then we had a second panel organized by uh, Stefan Hubner on Oceanic Asia. And uh, this was essentially a global history um, uh, type uh, panel, but we had colleagues from Harvard, Osaka, uh, Ritzmetan, Sofia, and Cambridge universities to contribute to this um, panel. And so clearly Oceanic studies is emerging as an exciting subfield in the environmental theme. Now, with the infrastructure theme, um, James Sidaway, who's a geographer in the Department of uh, uh, Geography at NUS, he leads the Max Weber Foundation Research Group on borders, mobility, and new infrastructures, and with a particular focus on cross-border infrastructures in Southeast Asia and beyond. And the most recent project to come out of this was on the BRI as a method. And so this, this ties in with our ambitions to think uh, use Asia as a as a sort of um, foundation on which we uh, we can theorize um, on uh, some of the important issues facing us. So these are uh, the four kind of projects that uh, have been funded uh, to very de uh, varying degrees. The largest uh, project we have at the moment is Taxi Transboundary Environmental Commons of Southeast Asia, and um, this is led by uh, Professor David Taylor of the geography department and has Michelle Miller, uh, uh, Tong An Trang and Rini Astuni. And then the second one is linking the digital humanities to biodiversity history in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And Anthony Medrano and Stefan Hugner are uh, particularly interested in developing the digital humanities aspect of this kind of research. And thirdly, archiving the underclasses knowledge law and everyday agency in modern Southeast Asia. This is an archive project, um, which is gonna come, oh, part of it is gonna be an archive project um, and it promises very interesting outcomes. And then last, uh, last, um, lastly, it's, uh, it's the one on COVID called Living with COVID-19 in, uh, COVID in Southeast Asia. Thanks, Maitri. Thanks very much, Naoko. Um, our next speaker will be Associate Professor Jamie Davidson, a leader of our identities cluster. Thank you, Maitri. Good evening, everyone. So I am the cluster leader of the Identities Cluster. It is among the uh, newer clusters. We have uh, two main cluster members, uh, postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Uh, Graham Wanhao Chow and Dr. Patrick Quinton Brown. I will discuss some of their research uh, shortly and uh, a host of cluster associates that in the interest of time, I will not go over, uh, name them individually. So what is the cluster all about? The Identities Cluster is principally devoted to advancing conceptual, theoretical, and methodological approaches to identities in Asia. These include national, ethnic, religious, racial, sexual, gender, political, generational, and others. The cluster is multidisciplinary in scope and is concerned with how identities are produced, where they come from, how they are reproduced and maintained, the processes and mechanisms by which they change or evolve over time and space, and what kinds of effects they produce. Finally, the cluster is also interested in investigating identity configurations across various scales and entities, from individuals and villages to organizations, nation states, and even relations among states. I think what nicely encapsulates what the uh, cluster is all about I was by the holding of uh, one of the RE at 20 uh, seminars uh, in, uh, past uh, September. It was called Identity Research in Asia, Past, Present, and Future Directions. It was very successful. We had, had 130 uh, Zoom participants. We invited three prominent uh, scholars, Sarupa Roy from Gutingen University, Peter Jackson from ANU, and Ayn Ong from Western Sydney University. They presented their thoughts on their own personal and professional histories and identities as they relate to the body of identities research in the respective fields. What are some of the key strands of research in our cluster? Well, I want to uh, present this to you by highlighting uh, two research projects in, in particular, one of, uh, both of them by our uh, postdoctoral fellows. The first one is, is Patrick's. 
A main uh, component of Patrick's research is located at the Nexus of Identities in Asia and International Relations, or IR, and starts with the Bandung or Asian African Conference of 1955. Though governments gathered, represented in nations of different sizes, ethnicities, religions, languages, and indeed political block alignments, there were certain principles, of, principles upon which they could all agree. Patrick's research explores what these principles upon which they could all agree were and how exactly do they relate to the identities that came associated with the third world or later the global south. More broadly, Patrick asks, how have particular Asian identities been built around the norms and practices of international law and international society? And how have those identities evolved and changed with what effects on the conducts of states? Patrick is exploring such questions in a nearly completed book manuscript. More specifically, it explores the ways in which states people have reordered intervention and non-intervention since the middle of the 20th century. It is concerned primarily with non-Western constellations of Western dominated order and provides a conceptual roadmap for understanding dilemmas of intervention and non-intervention today and the reconstruction of intervention and the globalization of the society of states. The second project I'd like to highlight is by our other uh, postdoctoral fellow, Graham. Graham's research focus focuses on everyday self-expressions of the Chinese Hui minority. Graham publishes in the fields of narrative study, material culture, and ethnology. The working title of his book project is Around the Dead Men We Gather. Negotiating Muslimness in China Through Death-Related Folklore. A major research question asked uh, in the book is on culturally dense and socially intense occasions. How do people living on ethnic and cultural margins identify and express themselves? Recognizing the marginal nature of Hui people, the manuscript instantiates the ethnic and personal identification processes of the Hui in death lore in a village where Hui and Han cultures, Islam and vernacular beliefs coexist and converge to engage with previously conducted research on the diversity of ethnic groups in China in particular and minority studies in general. The theoretical bent or basis is that a group of people, ethnic included, only emerges from ephemeral or and contingent performances. Similarly, a group be an ethnic minority a community, a neighborhood, or a family does not only emerge, but also disappears and separates through performances. So thank you very much. That was just a, a brief snapshot of some of the research that uh, is currently uh, being undertaken uh, in the cluster. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Our final presentation for this section will be Professor Brenda Yeo, leader of our Asian Migration Cluster. Good afternoon or good, good morning to people out there. I'm just trying to imagine um, Ari's diaspora, the very rich and uh, wonderful diaspora spread across the world coming together in this celebratory moment. Uh, but it's a bit challenging because all I see is a screen. So I'm hoping that if I stare hard enough at the screen, I will be able to send happy vibes to everyone. Uh, and uh, draw you in uh, in this celebratory moment. What I wanted to, in a sense, present is to um, showcase the Asian Migration Cluster as one of the key centers for migration research in Asia that focuses uh, explicitly on understanding migrations, mobilities, and interconnectivities within and beyond Asia. There are many migration centers in the world, but uh, I think the ARI Asian Migration Cluster is quite unique in its focus on Asia. Um, the cluster draws energy from our cluster members and associates that you see on the list here, uh, both past and present. And I apologize that the slide only reflects current membership, but the point I want to underscore is that um, the cluster pulls together synergies from uh, um, cluster members with different expertise into research teams, and that is, in a sense, the basis of how the cluster works. Uh, we organize our work uh, around four main themes, 
and members work in cross-cutting ways in developing workshops, projects, conferences, and so forth under these themes. Our, our first theme is on transnational migration and cities. Uh, and this here, we seek to understand the complex linkages between globalization and transnational mobility as they intersect in Asian cities, producing cities of diversity. This has, of course, been turned on its head by the pandemic, and uh, we are also continuing work that looks at how um, transnational migrants have been immobilized and the effects on, on city spaces as well. We normally work through uh, a series of workshops organized around the themes in order to try to explore and bring new knowledges together, in this case, on material processes and the discourses of global change and migration in cities. So, so here are some of our, our workshops, uh, including uh, one in 2017 on migrants in global cities across Europe, the Middle East and Asia, where we try to understand how global city making happens and how in the sense that produces migration diversity, as well as the possibility of cosmopolitan uh, urbanites. Um, the workshop in 2019 looks at migrant-led diversification, and here the interest is in how migrant groups are differentially included in a city of migration. We don't just focus on labor migration, but we've also uh, worked on marriage migration, and, uh, he, and this is one workshop that explores the gendered ideas of citizenship and the nexus between marriage, migration, family, and citizenship. Uh, on to our next theme, um, yes, which is a long-standing one. Uh, here we're interested in aspirations, migration, and development, focusing on the developmental impact of migration in sending communities and the cost and risk of migration for the poor. So what's um, a mainstay in the, in the cluster is this uh, focus on sending communities as opposed to the, the more plentiful work which focuses on whole societies. Our longstanding longitudinal project is called CHAMSI, Child Health and Migrant Parents in Southeast Asia. And this investigates the long-term impact of, migra of parental migration on the health and well-being of children. We have uh, completed uh, two waves of uh, data collection in the Philippines and Indonesia under CHAMSI. And uh, we were actually hoping to begin the third wave when the pandemic struck and um, our plans then have to be, in a sense, postponed. So, like the first theme, we also organize a series of workshops uh, around the idea of aspirations and uh, migration and development. But we also uh, push this out in terms of special issues and publications in journals and books. And I've just listed some of these here uh, to show the range of publications uh, in uh, geography journals, anthropology journals, youth journals, and migration journals. Okay, the third theme is on uh, migration industry and migration infrastructure. Here, we are not so much focused on uh, the migrants themselves, um, like in the earlier two themes, but we are interested in uh, the facilitators of migration. So the focus is on the role of migration brokerage and migration infrastructure in organizing, channeling, and facilitating mobilities and in that sense, also creating in-mobilities. Um, and uh, just draw one example of this, this theme, and this can be found in uh, some projects that we, we uh, organized under the Migrating Out of Poverty Research Consortium that lasted seven years, uh, ended uh, a few years ago. And for this theme on the migration industry, we focused research on uh, low-wage migrant workers, domestic workers, basically, and looked at their ability to gain uh, social and economic mobility for themselves and their families vis-a-vis -vis the workings of the migration industry. Um, and here I want to, in a sense, highlight that apart from workshops and research projects and publications, 
we are also interested in pushing out um, outreach events and um, different ways of reaching the public with our research findings, as seen here in short films that uh, the team has created. Uh, Syria is about uh, a returning Indonesian domestic worker and her dreams of setting up a library in her village is, is very short, so do, do take a look if you're interested. And we also accompany this with um, uh, Asia Trend public outreach events. Um, the one shown here has to do with exploring how migrant domestic workers and employment agents factor in Singapore's long-term care provision for families. Um, and uh, moving on then to my final theme, right? And here, um, the focus here is on transnational migration and aging. And under this particular theme, we are interested in the way that care is provisioned for older adults, but also how care is provided by older adults. So the, the, the two faces of, uh, the, of, of the care network. Uh, and this we do in the context of care circulations and rapid population aging. Um, and featured under here is the TRACE project on transnational relations, aging and care ethics. And uh, since my time is, is up, I will just mention that uh, we are very interested in the in cluster to develop new methodologies for researching migration. And featured here is uh, the endeavor to use uh, qualitative GIS in the TRACE project and uh, the results has been quite promising as, as seen in this particular uh, article that was published uh, just this year. Yeah, so I think with that, I, I, I end the presentation and pass this all back to our chair. Thank you very much, Prof. Yo, and thank you everyone uh, for sharing us with us the exciting research that's being pursued um, at ARI. We now shift to our second session, our roundtable discussion about the future of Asia, moderated by Professor Tantayon, Chairman of ARI's International Advisory Board. Uh, Prof. Tan, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Maitri. Hello, everyone. My name is Tan Tayong, and I'm the newly appointed uh, Chair of ARI's International Advisory Board. It's my pleasure to moderate uh, the panel discussion following the very informative uh, presentation by seven cluster leaders. I thank them for sharing um, very useful information on the focus of your work and the issues they are all addressing. Maybe I should start by posing a general question to uh, whoever from the sort of seven cluster leaders would like to answer. And that's basically to ask, um, you know, what do you see are uh, the, the key existing and emerging, existing and emerging Asia-centered issues uh, that ARI needs to engage through its cluster? I know many of you have already mentioned um, themes like environmental challenges, pandemics, changing structures, uh, social structures. But what do you see are some of the key um, emerging themes that you think um, Ari should be paying attention to? Any, any takers? Maybe I'll start with uh, the newest, Jamie. <laughs> Thanks, Prof Tan. Yeah, I, I, obviously I think, uh, promote our cluster, I think that people need to take uh, identity more seriously, right? Alongside the kind of old, uh, more traditional, maybe uh, some social sciences, uh, interests, right? ideologies, uh, institutions. Uh, I think if you've paid uh, much any attention to what's been uh, developing in Singapore, but also other countries in the region, the past uh, year, six months or so, is uh, this you know percolation of of uh, uh, identity politics. Uh, I think some people for many years have kind of uh, wished this away, and hoping uh, these types of uh, energies or expressions could be diffused through different organizations, different interests, different groups. But it seems to be something that. Uh, uh, seemingly was kind of, for some people was always there, for some people uh, didn't really want to pay attention. And I think the more you don't pay attention, the, the, uh, the higher the cost will be when, when you do uh, pay the proper attention. 
And it's, it's just something that from uh, ordinary people to elites to, to state you know, policymakers are, are really going to have to grapple with, um, uh, you know, uh, just, just gets accentuated in the era of inequality and COVID. Uh, people have to become more comfortable talking about it in, in the public realm in ways that um, it's hard to, right, to talk about it productively and not to offend. But uh, it's just something that uh, scrubbing it from public view I think we'll eventually have some type of blowback or, or backlash that uh, people, I think, wisely could prevent with some force, force thought and um, some prescription. So anyway, yeah, again, to promote the, the cluster, the identities paradigm, particularly in Asia, uh, isn't going anywhere. and It's going to be with us for a very long time. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Greg, maybe I'll turn to you. Do you have any thoughts on technology, society, and and and, and a very wide-ranging work that your cluster does in, in, in terms of addressing these themes? Yeah, it's very wide-ranging. Science and technology, the STEM disciplines are, are very large, so we have to be selective in what we choose. And I guess we've we've um, gravitated increasingly toward environmental issues because the global scientific community is gravitating toward those because they're a crisis. And uh, so we're very aware of that crisis. I'm very aware of living in the middle of a rainforest, um, which gives us a particular perspective in Southeast Asia on biodiversity issues. The, we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. Um, a lot of science these days is crisis related science. And so I think uh, that wasn't how we started out. We started out 10 years ago, just looking at uh, Biopolis down the road. Um, and um, and looking at uh, simply simply health issues and medical issues, but now increasingly, our focus is we're still looking at health and medical issues, but within the context of of a larger environmental crisis. Any others would like to, uh, Brenda? I, I I kind of see you moving ahead. So well, you have a comment. Well, I mean, uh, I was yeah. just responding to Greg's um, sense of. Crisis. I mean, uh, and and so was there. Of course, many long-standing asia center issues that will continue to occupy the attention of all the classes here. I thought, thinking about crisis, that maybe we should think about the three C's that will deserve a priority on research agendas. And I, I don't know whether we're thinking about the same thing, but um, my three C's to make it simple, uh, is COVID, climate, and China. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so for, for COVID, I think it's quite clear that it's, it's major implications for the migration cluster, it's major implications on migration and mobility, because you know you have the, the speeded up kind of transnational mobility in the, in the age of globalization, but this has stalled. Border crossings has become very difficult, dangerous, and even discriminatory in some in pandemic times. And we need to deal with crucial questions, very fundamental questions like whether we are seeing the end of the age of migration uh, as we know it. So of course we, we, we think not because the Asian migration uh, cluster has a, a rationale for continuing. Um, and similarly with the climate emergency, I mean, that's another very pressing issue that I don't think any of the clusters can avoid that will command attention. And, and already there's been calls for more ambitious and urgent climate change mitigation kind of issues. And for the migration cluster, this is linked to whether this will spur uh, greater irregular and undocumented and precarious migrations, and therefore the need to think about um, the migration regime and the provision of uh, this decent work for migrants in order to avoid that kind of uh, crisis that unfolds from another crisis. And China, I'll throw that in because um, that's an important piece of the geopolitical jigsaw puzzle. Uh, China Southeast Asia relations, very important. Um, in the migration cluster, we are hosting a new project called BRISM, which is Belt and Road Initiative, Belt and Road and International Student Mobilities. So the idea here is uh, not so much to focus on the infrastructural aspects of BRI, but to think about the emerging knowledge spaces and circulation and the possibility of a new Asian 
regionalism. So those are my three C's in response to Greg's crisis. Thanks, Brenda. Building on what you and Greg have said, you know, and that's the question to just come in, um, whether there are sort of cross-cutting themes that could facilitate uh, inter-cluster collaboration. And, and what are the possibilities? Are there examples of this happening? And are there events that one could look forward to where clusters come together to address these very big issues that many of you are addressing in common? Greg, I see your hand and I see Ken also, and then I'll go. Greg, you go first. Yeah, well, a very good example of that is our, our long-standing work on disasters in the region. And uh, we put together, our cluster and Asian urbanisms put together a tier two grant application co-written and uh, a few years ago, it's just finished, but it was a it was on a disaster in Southeast Asia, which we'd, we'd done previous work on and we're still doing work on. And the, but the other, the more, the bigger thing, I mean, we've done, so we've done these uh, cross uh, cluster uh, collaborations and research, but I'm more impressed by the fact that, as Brenda said, a lot of the themes that used to be within one cluster are now extending across all the clusters, the environment, Extending, extending across, uh, you know, all the clusters, uh, and so there's a lot more opportunity, I think, in the next few years for the clusters to work together than there ever has been. Uh, Ken, yes, thank you. Uh, we've worked very uh, closely with uh, with the migration cluster on the role of religion in migration in Asia, uh, as well as with Asian urbanisms on. Uh, the impact of urban space on ritual and religious community. And uh, we see a lot of uh, crossovers with, with, with many of the clusters. The, uh, uh, in relation to the BRI, uh, the example I'd like to raise is, is a, a Southeast Asian initiative to uh, not just Ilai uh, Ilu, but Ihai uh, Imiao, uh, one uh, temple. Uh, one, one ocean, one temple. It's, it's a great, a great slogan, uh, suggesting that Southeast Asian uh, earth god temples can unify horizontally across the region and create their own networks and their own responses to uh, kind of top-down initiatives uh, from, over, from China or from uh, uh, local governments, uh, indicating that a lot of these religious communities have a great deal of uh, autonomy within their own uh, respective communities and and politics. So so yeah, we 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 see all kinds of possibilities for uh, interaction across the clusters. Uh, in terms of the science and technology cluster, we've recently tried to develop ecological maps of, for Singapore with Stephen Hoopner's uh, work uh, help, and uh, he's in the IEA cluster. So all these all these. Uh, 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 researchers work across uh, the different regions to develop things. Uh, and that links really up to uh, what Tim mentioned about heritage and how uh, heritage is such an important part of uh, the study of religion and community. And uh, cultural heritage is such an important theme for RE to continue to uh, uh, research uh, across all of these clusters. Thank you, Ken. Uh, now go. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is actually quite a good point to jump in because of what uh, Ken has just said about um, the importance of cultural heritage. And uh, because cultural heritage can be actually studied uh, from so many different angles. And um, I think in our cluster, uh, there is growing interest in looking at um, cultural heritage as an infrastructural uh, project. Uh, which is not just about cultural policy or the, you know, of the, or the conservation of, um, you know, uh, World Heritage sites and what have you, but that they become actually economic and political issues within the region uh, because of the uh, prominence of some of these um, cultural heritage projects uh, throughout Southeast Asia. So I think that's a very interesting and promising um, new lead that, or lead that's on the existing uh, kind of um, framework that we already have. And in terms of um, cross fertilization um, amongst the clusters, I, I think it's gonna be more and more, I think moving that way. And mainly because of what Brenda's uh, mentioned about the three Cs, 
uh, you know, in IE, obviously, we also <laughs> cover the three C's in exactly the way that you say, but from a slightly different angle. Um, and uh, like, for example, if all be well, we might be able to have a, a joint kind of appointments in future with uh, clusters uh, of the new hires um, and so on. So I see all kind of positive signs about uh, increased collaboration uh, between the clusters. Thank you. Tim, Tim, you have a comment? Yes, thank, thanks, Taeyong. Actually, uh, also uh, just stimulated by um, the comments that, uh, that Naoko just made, another, another term at least which uh, seems to circulate across um, many clusters at the moment and is reflective of wider intellectual trends is infrastructure. Mm. You know, whether this is uh, material infrastructure, which is familiar to urbanists like me, migration infrastructure, which I know Brenda and some of her collaborators have written about, um, obviously infrastructures of connectivity, even the kind of, um, you know, what, what enables the, uh, the imagination of um, you know, connected temples can be understood as a form of uh, infrastructure too. So um, I raise that partly as a topic in its, in its own right, but also because I think like climate, which we've already talked about, I think there are important questions for us here about should we be identifying topics which have an appeal because they are cross cluster? Or should we be trying to identify new topics which can be new clusters in their own right? And I think that's an interesting uh, uh, dilemma. Well, maybe, maybe it's my dilemma as director, but, but, it's, uh, but it's one I think is uh, open for discussion here as well. So to what extent are these, are these topics that we're seeing that we're all engaging with in different ways, uh, signs that they should be, um, institutionally framed as cross cluster uh, topics or to what extent can uh, can new topics be uh, be the focus of, of, of novel uh, new cluster formations in their own right thank you Tim. Jean I'm going to ask you to come on and, and, and share your views as well and also to address this question has just come in someone is quite saddened by the by the knowledge that your cluster is going to close and asking whether uh, even with the sort of um, changes that are happening to the cluster, will there be further research in ARI on uh, family in some other forms or being undertaken by some other cluster? Jean, your views, please. Uh, yes, uh, Taeyong, thank you. And uh, thank you, I appreciate the comment for the great the work that we have done in the family cluster. Um, yes, for sure, we will continue to do uh, work on family in Asia. There's this is a key uh, critical point. In fact, uh, since there's a lot of family changes, critical family changes and population changes that uh, are happening that uh, is affecting everyone's lives. Uh, you know your your the topic you mentioned about fatherhood uh, mm. because of the COVID nineteen. Uh, a lot of the gender roles we're expecting and hope, hope, hoping to change uh, the, the role of how we organize work and family is something that we will continue to look at. Uh, we've been uh, studying how paternity leave affect uh, fatherhood roles and how they uh, that affect uh, father child and family relationship and so on. Other important topics such as, you know, uh, again, coming back to COVID-19, that's the, probably the most uh, timely um, topic now and that, that cross cuts every clusters too, definitely uh, family cluster. Um, so, you know, how the economic impact of uh, the family, how inequality are, is expected to increase and affect uh, women uh, children's lives. Those are very, very important topics that we, we are continuing to research. Other topics I like uh, the changing population uh, dynamics. Certainly aging is something that we will continue to focus a lot on and uh, we have been doing a lot, but uh, these, uh, a lot of population societies are losing uh, population, uh, population decline, including Singapore. So this population uh, decline and uh, you know more people are choosing to have no children at all, no not getting married and uh, living alone. These are themes that we have already started before COVID-19. 
So these are topics that are actually becoming a lot more important because of COVID-19. And uh, we've collected a lot of data now before COVID-19 and during COVID-19 that uh, we'll definitely continue to um, you know, explore and study this issue and publishing them. And I look forward to continue to collaborate with uh, our RE uh, colleagues in all kinds of different topics. So do not despair. Definitely we'll continue to work on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. I have two questions that are connected and we're gonna to try to put them together. One is about understanding Asia on its own terms, despite its differences, um, how all clusters are trying to develop some concept of, of Asia and the distinctiveness of Asia. Now, the question is, of course, how do then do you push back in, in, in a process of doing this, this whole idea of provincializing Asia from you know, European Western perspectives? And then linked to that is this question of a, a global Asia, you know, the concept of a global Asia and how do clusters think about this, this whole concept? So it's about doing things that are and yet drawing it so that you know you offer knowledge that goes beyond Asia that has global kind of uh, implications and distinctiveness. Um, anybody like to address those, those, those? First, what's, what's distinctive about Asia and, and, and the theories, your research, and then think of it as kind of a globe, globalized this Asian understanding. Uh, Ken, I see your hand. Uh, yeah. Uh... I think there's a great deal to be uh, gained by looking at Asian historical experience, especially uh, the long history of intercultural, interreligious uh, interactions, uh, hybrid cultural formations, and uh, plurality of religious traditions, and uh, attempting to push back against the uh, very Western-oriented uh, definitions of religion that, that have uh, impacted uh, societies here through uh, imperialism and colonial experience and the transfer of categories into Asia and into policy in Asia. So uh, I think we have a tremendous opportunity. Uh, in terms of how these concepts can turn into a global Asia, we can also see many of these formations, lineages, temple networks extending into uh, even uh, Asian Christianities extending into Europe and around the world and uh, creating new uh, transformations in the uh, ecologies of, of, of those uh, religious ecologies of those areas. Uh, so there's, there's a great deal of very interesting theoretical and empirical work that can be done in, in transforming our uh, reliance on, on uh, uh, earlier paradigms. A any other takers? Other panelists? Uh, oh, I was just going to add that uh, I think it does require collaborations across the different clusters in order to contribute to, you know, theorizing from the South uh, when the South is often used just as a testing ground for theories based on the experiences of the North. So pushing back against this will I think require not just uh, directing more resources and more research to Asia as the so-called non-West, but uh, it has to go beyond that. So it needs to, in a sense, think of Asia having its own identity and context, whether this is a social, cultural, political kind of context, and we need to recover conceptual insights that respect human experience as lived in Asia uh, and that kind of endeavor would be kind of important. So just to illustrate it, from migration research, I mean, uh, traditional migration research is very focused on concepts of assimilation and acculturation and integration because it's, it's basically based on permanent migration. But we know in Asia, the, the primary mode uh, of migration is temporary migration and uh, where you know, the paradigms of assimilation and integration do not apply. So it's, it's important to look at uh, other ways of understanding uh, migration that's um, in a sense true to, to Asia. And here we, the classes are working on issues to do with enforced transients, uh, permanent temporariness in order to reflect the precarious conditions under which migrant workers 
in many Asian cities are uh, invited to labor, but not to stay. So um, that, that's just one example of how, in a sense, we cannot um, just apply the Western uh, base paradigms to this region, but to, to, in a sense, work together to push back, as I think uh, Ashwari mentions. Hmm. Uh, other thoughts, Jamie. I, I I think you you have an you want to speak, right, Jamie? Yeah, go ahead. So if I understand the conversation, I'm going to comment on uh, uh, operationalizing global Asia, in uh, and then um, kind of pushing back on Western uh, theorization. So you know, from a Danny's perspective, I you know I don't know if I could off the top of my head give you a satisfactory definition of of global Asia, but to me, I could think of a few examples off the top of my head that encapsulate uh, what, what global Asia uh, could could mean, right? If it's study of identity, particularly, I don't mean to step on Prof uh, Dean's uh, toes, but on, on religion, right? You set, look at something as old as like Catholicism in the Philippines from something as new as the rise of mega churches in Singapore. I mean, those are wonderful examples of global Asia, right? They have, they neither of them in some respects have origins in Asia, but they have incredible impact on Asia. They indigenize in certain ways, but they get they continue to get fueled and um, and changed. Not just because of relations domestically, but the relations um, uh, globally, their international network. So that's I think two really uh, fine examples of what we mean by global Asia. Uh, on the second point about uh, theorization uh, and identity, I think it's um, it's uh, the the changing nature or 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 fundamentals of the modern nation state. You know, a lot of this is based on European conceptions and in particular the separation of church and state, which is a very modern idea, but also one in which the modern nation, modern nation state was founded. And um, there's always been pushback on that, but, you know, pushback it, it, historically, but it, recently or in the last you know decade or so, it's becoming increasingly a difficult dam on which to kind of hold, uh, to, to separate the two, right? Uh, someone mentioned earlier, Modi's uh, India. You can see developments in Thailand, developments in Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, the church in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, Singapore is trying, uh, of course, its hardest. And, and so you're starting to see this, um, I think, seepage. And it, it gets to a point where is, is this uh, becoming exceptional or it's becoming uh, quite widespread throughout uh, Asia? And maybe reconfiguring the role of religion, in, not just in, in public life, but you know, almost at the constitutional level, right? It's really a state-based level. But that said, you know, neither do I think this is particularly Asian. You, you look at, you know, where I'm from, the United States, and uh, trying to. There's a lot of Americans who 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 believe in, in the Christian basis of, of of the American state. So uh, you you see it on the rise in Asia, but but neither would I call this particularly Asian. So yeah, it's a little this and a little that. Thank you. Uh, Nalko? Yeah, so um, I actually uh, sort of have a problem in terms of um, uh, trying to understand what global Asia means. I mean, <laughs> you know, as a global historian of Asia, this might seem like a very strange thing to say, but um, I do sense this kind of tension between what we think is um, kind of uh, what it means to have theorizations uh, coming out of Asia. Does it mean that like Asian scholars doing this or does it mean scholars based on Asia doing this? Or does it mean like the empirical, uh, you know, data uh, based in Asia on Asia from which theories derive. Um, because if you think about uh, many of the major theorists, right, uh, in the recent past, I mean, that we all know, like James Scott, um, you know, Ben and Anderson, uh, Homi Baba, you know, even Edward Said, they're all basing their experiences or uh, empirics on the uh, on Asian experiences. So uh, Asia has always been there. In, in terms of um, kind of theories, like these are very grand powerful theories. So what do we really mean? And I think um, if we are talking about um, kind of theoreticians coming out of Asia, i.e. 
people like us based here in Ari doing this thing? Um, you know, is that what we want? Or what is it that we really uh, uh, are thinking about? And this is something that's really kind of puzzled me for a long time. So I just wanted to bring it out and share. I'd love to hear what you think about this. You've got any views on this kind of thing? Thank you, Nafu. Uh, Greg? We also don't want to lose the sense of diversity of Asia, and it's a big place. And um, I mean, some of my friends in Japan tease me that we use the term Asia more often in Singapore than in any other place in Asia. Uh, Asia is very real here because we're in the center of a lot of places. Uh, when I go to Japan, I don't. I hear the word Asia means somewhere else. Um, in India, it doesn't mean East Asia; it means that part of the world. So the the, um, uh, I think also, even though we are a place where we're theorizing Asia, we also, a lot of us are doing empirical work in particular parts, and that's just as valuable. That's my only point. So Greg, since you have the floor, uh, why don't you address that, that last question? And I think I'll end with this question about um, um, you, the SDS cluster going beyond hard science and technology, but to explore the other way around, social science and humanities, using technology to explain social science uh, and technology, humanities roles in society, and also address uh, Jack Chia's question as to whether Ari is also collaborating with the sciences um, beyond the, the humanities and social sciences, are there interactions with the, the science part of, of campus here? Well, yeah, I mean, I've just put together a big grant application with a somebody from the Department of Biological Sciences so, and, uh, and also with a zoologist. So we definitely are. In fact, every single large grant application we've done has involved at least uh, one, science, one or more scientists. And I also just met, I mentioned in my presentation that scientists are approaching us, mm. also get involved in their projects. I think that the, I've increasingly learned over time that the, bound, the supposed boundary between the humanities and social sciences and the hard sciences is, is really fluid. And I think that a lot of my colleagues in the humanities and social sciences don't realize how excited scientists are to work with us and how oftentimes they raise questions which are humanities questions and which they would like us to get involved in answering. I mean, I just came off of a conference in Fukushima which was, in which I was the only humanities scholar there. Uh, everybody else was a medical doctor or radiation researcher, but they were, they were all actually, many of them were doing uh, social science, but they didn't call it social science. They called it science or in my presence or in the presence of mm -hmm. others, social scientists, they tend to raise new questions that come from their research, but in which they don't publish about. So I think the opportunities for such cross fertilization are, are huge. And particularly now that, as I said, we're in a a crisis situation going to everything from COVID to biodiversity to climate change. There's the opportunities within a lot of our clusters to talk with, with people and not just the sciences, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm about to step down as a cluster leader and my replacement, uh, Chang Jat Wee is from the architecture department, which is now merging with engineering. <laughs> so, uh, which is another cross fertilization, which he's going to bring here. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the folks in architecture, the folks in engineering also are very amenable, I've found, to engaging with us. Yeah. Uh, Tim, Tim, and then Naoko, uh, final points. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I'm partly just echoing the kind of things that, uh, that Greg's been saying here, and I think I flagged them in the, uh, in the excruciating video that I had to watch at the beginning. And that is to say, <laughs> I think that there's, um, you know, there's, there's real value for Ari in deep interdisciplinarity. So I don't mean merely collaborating amongst disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, but rather us as humanities and social science scholars, um, collaborating with people in the sciences, in medicine, in law, in, in architecture and engineering, the way that Greg's um, just described. And of course, environment and climate are perhaps the, the, the most obvious examples there. Some of, the, some of the projects that Greg's already uh, mentioned in the SDS cluster um, have already done this. Nalco has talked about others in the inter-Asia engagements cluster. So I think that ARI, humanities and social science scholars in general have really important roles to play in those larger, deep interdisciplinary projects. And I also think we have something, in sp something specific to offer. 
Um, and that is, especially in relation to environment, and I think that is the governance dimension. And I think this is one of the things that, that scientists and others really value in humanities and social sciences. We're not just talking about government and policy, but because we have deep historical understanding, we have contextual knowledge of how societies and cultures work, these are really important matters for long-term governance issues that have lasting impacts in the ways that policies can just shift like that. So I think that's a really important, uh, a really important point. Um, now go. Yeah, um, I entirely agree with what uh, Tim said. And also just going back right to the beginning when Jamie said, uh, talked about the importance of identities and what kind of areas that uh, Ari uh, should um, look into in the future. I really think that we have to um, rethink about this idea of uh, political culture because that's something that, um, that hasn't really been dealt with in the recent past, I think, in Nari. And maybe this is more your identities cluster kind of topic, but I do think that, you know, governmentality, governance, that those kind of ideas are really, uh, you know, underscored by, underpinned by um, understanding of political culture and how politics work and how power is seen. Because the, you know, this may be where we talk a bit about this kind of uh, particularities of the Asian, uh, Asian, you know, <laughs> experiences, because political cultures are, you know, not, they're, they're not all the same. And I do think that politics is something that, uh, that we, we might want to think more about, uh, particularly if Ari is going to be, uh, you know, promoting increased collaboration uh, with sciences, because that's what they, they probably want to pick our brains for. Uh, but uh, one thing I would say is that um, I think all this uh, sort of uh, scientists, engineers reaching out to humanities and social sciences is wonderful. But I don't think, uh, I don't want us to be service sector for them, because I think we, we actually have our own right to be here. And, you know, what we do is very important. And I, I don't think we should just be kind of drawn into project just as a token historian, a token social scientist, so that, you know, their project becomes somehow more uh, social science or humanities based, because I don't think one person or two is going to change the way fundamentally they think it would be just picking our brains to, to do their work in the way that they would want to do. Because I do think that fundamentally, humanities and social sciences is just so important to um, to any society that we just have to keep it going and strengthen what we do and uh, and also to reach out to um, different uh, disciplines and sectors but with our identity intact I think. Thank you Naoko. There was a question about hiring plans for the clusters so I guess the answer to that would be to look out to, to the RE website to look for uh, opportunities and I'm sure the clusters are always looking for wonderful people so do look out for these opportunities and on that note I'm going to um, end the discussion and hand over to director Tim Bunnell for his closing concluding remarks Tim okay thank you uh, Taeyong um, on the one hand I feel like we just gave you momentum but don't worry I'm not going to turn back to the discussion um, <laughs> It's it's nine nine thirty here in Singapore, and I and I realise um, uh, it, it's getting late, and not not least for the uh, for the ad, admin staff. Um, I won't go over my two minutes, but uh, largely I'll just use them to to say thanks to uh, uh, to various people because that's that, that's really important. Um, so I mentioned them already. Ari's events team, um, wonderfully uh, dependable. And um, any of the technical issues that arose today are not their fault. They're mostly mine, I think. So uh, thank you to them, uh, as always. Naoko, Naoko Shimazu, thank, thank you, because Naoko um, was the person who's led this uh, roundtable series. And I can tell you in the face of COVID-19 disruptions, uh, there's been lots of organisation and reorganisation. And so I'm very grateful uh, to you, Naoko, for that too. Um, this evening, thanks, Maitri. Um, for, for chairing, um, fellow cluster leaders for, for your presentations. And of course, uh, Taeyong, thank you uh, for, for leading the uh, discussion. I'm also very grateful to everybody who's, who's tuned in. And I note with particular thanks that that includes several members of ARI's International Advisory Board, 
this is really seriously one of the upsides of being forced into virtual mode during the anniversary year, you know, having this kind of, uh, maybe we call it global Asia, I don't know, uh, tempting fate, but uh, also um, involving all these um, um, wonderful uh, associates and, uh, and, and alumni of ARI that Brenda gestured uh, to earlier as well. The, ARI, the idea of ARI 20, just to remind everyone one last time, was not so much to showcase what ARI has already done, but rather to help us to focus attention and energy for the Institute's third decade, which we've now entered. Um, I really look forward to working with many of you in, in different ways during that third decade, maybe even beyond, uh, in helping to sustain ARI as a major intellectual asset for NUS, for Singapore, uh, and for the region, a region where critical humanities and social sciences perspectives and the deep contextual knowledge that it generates and that we value remains, I think, as, as important as ever. So thank you, everyone. And on that, night, that, that note, I'll say good night to all of you. Thanks. <laughs>